Good morning to everyone that is just joining us the now and also good morning to many of the people that are watching this on the replay. Welcome to another one of our online learn learning webinars. This time it's all about building regulations and basement conversions. I'm your host Andy Ferguson and joining me this morning is PC's technical manager James Berry. We are about to start the main presentation. Just for all those that have joined us, if you are looking to pose a question over the course of the webinar, we point you over towards the comment section on the desktop. It's just running down your left and right hand side. On a mobile, it should be just at the bottom. If you just pull up, you'll see the comments button. Feel free to say hello and tell us where you are in the world. Um, if you don't want to use the comments, you can also email me at andy at property-care.org. That's andy at property-care.org. If you're watching this on the replay, um, feel free to use that email address to fire any questions and I will do my best to try get those questions answered. Well, James, I can see it's nicely nine o'clock. It looks like it's supposed to... Uh, we're bang on time to start the main event. So since the tragic event of Grenfell, I think we've all seen that building regs have been receiving a lot of media attention. But when it comes to building regulations and basement conversions, what do we need to know? What key considerations do we need to take account? And for all property and construction pros that are all tuned into this, how do we stay on the right side of both the law and best practice? Some big questions for you, big chap. Yeah, you are. You've stolen me, stolen me punchlines already. Oh. <laughs> one, there we are. I'm impressed that there's someone called Adrian Adrian as well. That's um, in, in the chat. So I assume that's probably just an error. But there we are. Well, Let's, let's move on. Uh, let's get going. Um, all right. Morning, everybody. Um, thanks for coming along. A lot of you... Um, you know, like I say, twice in two days for, for some of you. Um, so a lot of you obviously season hands as well. Looks like a lot of you have been in the industry for, for a little while and, and been doing basement conversions. A lot of you, there's a lot of unfamiliar names on there as well, which is great. You know, this is what this is all about. Um, so for some of you, a lot of this will be sort of quite familiar for, for some of you that, that and the, for those of you that that might be some, some stuff in there that's a bit uh, thought provoking. Um, and there'll be some other stuff which will be quite basic and, you know, but fundamental level. But for, for those that, you know, aren't looking at basements on such a regular basement, but sort of some key considerations when sort of undertaking, um, you know, inspections of basements or, or if you're involved in basements at any level. So hopefully we should move on and we have. Perfect. Great. So a bit of background. Um, and the numbers look pretty good for this morning, which is fantastic. Um, building regs and basement conversions, I thought was going to be quite a, a niche little topic um, and quite a dry one as well. Um, building regs are, are not always the most stimulating topic for, for everyone. So it's good to, to see we've still got good numbers. That's great. But um, just a, a bit of background. So basements and, and why now? So for for anyone that knows, we produced a, a guidance, or we were asked to produce a guidance document on, on the topic about two years ago. Um, and we released a, the said document about 18 months ago. But why have we taken until now to, to turn it into a webinar? Um, and the simple answer is, well, the world of, of basements is becoming increasingly popular anyway. Um, you know, recent studies, there's a, a study by the uh, University of Newcastle a couple of years ago sort of said that there is within London in the last 10 years um, there'd been close to 5,000 mega basements um, you know two story plus basements and you know that's the, the high end stuff you know you consider most basements are only going to be single story um, so this is you know there is a huge amount of movement towards sort of basements and, and becoming increasingly popular um, they're conceived as a, a bit of a, a social status thing. Um, you know, the, the latest designer must have luxury, as some perceive it, but um, they're becoming more and more popular. But as a result of the pandemic, our, our needs have, have changed for, for properties we're buying. Um, there have been a, a number of articles that have come out and um, said that we are looking for more adaptable homes. We're We've embraced technology as a result of the, the pandemic. We've seen that, um, 
you know, we have the technology to be able to work from home and, and work remotely. This, you know, some have sort of been dragged kicking and screaming, but we've had to adapt, you know, take these webinars, for example. But it's possible. We, our, our needs are changing. We're looking for more adaptable homes. And um, what's more adaptable than a basement? It gives you um, huge amounts of opportunity and potential. So why are we doing it now? Um, we think they're becoming more popular. There seems to be sort of suggestions in, in sort of media articles that are coming out that suggesting what we're looking for in our homes are now slightly different and we think we're going to see more more and more basement conversions so as the custodians of best practice we want to make sure they're done properly and, and this is why we're we're looking at doing this this presentation now so just a, a bit on me so um and i will mean a very brief bit i mean i'm james berry i'm one of the technical managers here at the pca as andy said um I know this is about building regs. We are not going to be going into sort of the molecular detail of sort of each of the building regs. We don't have time. We've only got 40 minutes plus, you know, I probably bought a socks up here. And I come from a waterproofing background. I'm not from a building control background. So, you know, I know it from a waterproofing background and that's what we're going to be looking at today. Um, it's going to be sort of general guidelines and, and sort of headline figures. And, and like I say, something to, that should hopefully be quite thought provoking as well. Um, I don't know if we've got any of our Celtic brothers and sisters among us, um, but I will put a big caveat. This is predominantly about the English building regs. Um, it's probably going to be very, very similar um, for the, the other regions, but um, we're predominantly looking at the English ones. So still fairly early in the morning, just to check that you're still awake. Um, let's start with a poll. Andy, are you? Oh, yes, yes, I'm, I'm awake. <laughs> Go on, can you pour uh, out that poll for us, please? So, yeah, no, I will do. Well, folks, as you quick, think, uh, quick test to you all. Um, does the conversion of an existing basement to a habitable space require planning permission? Well, folks, we that poll should be over to you at this moment in time. Um, I'm just going to leave this up just for maybe about 10 seconds or so. I can see there's a mix of answers here, James, that are actually coming in quite interesting. Uh, okay, guys, just uh, another three, two, one, and I'm just ending the poll just to now. So, James, I don't know if you can see the results, but 37% um, say yes, 34% say no, and 28% says depend. Oh, wow, what a mix. Have we ever had a poll so sort of divided? That's no, I can't remember disgusting. the last time when it's been so split like that. No, and uh, wow, that's... Um... Well, let me move back onto that. Well, that is interesting. Um, and oh, well, let's dive into it. So, and, and it, it was a bit of a mean question, I will concede that. So, planning permission. In my, and we're talking about basement conversions, of course. So, if you're converting existing space into a habitable space, um, a Victorian cellar, that sort of thing. So, in most cases, planning permission is unlikely to be needed when converting an existing cellar. Um, so if it's like I say a simple conversion from a, an existing victorian cellar for, for storage or something like that you are unlikely to need planning permission um the slight exceptions will be depending on the extent of the work you're doing um so if you are going to need to start lowering floors um particularly if you've got shallow foundations things like that um then you may need planning permission um However, um, most modest extensions will fall under permitted development rights. So things like uh, if you're adding a light well, you're, you're changing the external appearance of the building, you will need planning permission. And you might need to add a, a light well as well for, and we'll go into to more details on that later. But most basement conversions or cellar conversions, whatever you want to say, will fall under permitted development rights, depending on the, the extent of the work. What are permitted development rights? Permitted development rights are essentially a, a different from planning consent because they are derived from parliament, not from, from local government. So there's sort of some overarching rules on, on what you're allowed to do without needing planning permission. Um, there are some restrictions on that though. Um, so, if you're in a national park, if you're in a conservation area, if it's a flat or a maisonette or a commercial building, there are some other restrictions as well. Like I say, we are doing sort of overline sort of headline figures, but generally um, 
you'll get these works under uh, your permitted development rights, which are sort of a, a legislation sort of outside local authorities. I will say though, um, beware local sort of planning variations. Um, variations can vary massively between um, even sort of London boroughs. Um, I think this is sort of quite a, a famous example and, and each sort of local government seems or local council seems to have their um their own sort of different perceptions on on basements so this was quite a famous example that hit the media's uh the tabloids in chelsea fairly recently i'm sure it's one that's sort of familiar to most of you um it got a lot of bad press and and basements sort of seem to take the rap for for a lot of it um I'm going to try and do a little bit of trying to set the record straight from my limited knowledge of the case but um the headlines all said you know uh, the development of a mega basement has caused the, the collapse of this townhouse in london um but in reality um what they neglected to mention in most of those tabloid stories was that they'd taken out just about every internal wall uh, from the ground floor up so there was no structural stability there um it was just unfortunate the poor old contractor next door was called um something basement so um they got the rap as well and they weren't even working on this building but um but there we are it was more to do with um what they've done to the internal works rather than the basement but there is this perception of basements and, and that's caused sort of quite a lot of variations in between local governments so just beware on that um but the other thing with um with planning permission if in doubt always check so most will be covered by um, permitted development rights depending on the extent of what you're doing if you've, you've got sort of everything all in place and um, it's a fairly straightforward build you're probably going to get away without needing plan permission but why risk it if, if in doubt if you've got any sort of any concerns find out in the first instance so um, just double check just um to, to look at some other consents as well that that might be needed prior to sort of a basement conversion uh, the first is um listed building consent so if you're doing works in a, a listed building then you're probably gonna well, you will need listed building uh, consent if you fail to get it it's actually a criminal offense so if you've got an old building that you think may be listed just make sure you, you've got that prior to any works um I'm not going to cover listed buildings in any great detail here, but I am going to give a bit of a plug for what is probably going to be a future video coming out from the PCA and probably a guidance document as well. So watch this space for that and, and maybe a future webinar in in the future. But um, yeah, so watch out listed buildings. You are going to need additional consent for, for works on listed buildings. And the Party Wall Act as well. So chances are for almost all basement conversions, you're probably going to need to notify your neighbour um, and, and go through the, the Party Wall Act. So is notice required? Um, make sure you, you give adequate notice. Um, and even if it's not going to fall uh, within the Party Wall Act, let's be honest that there is a, a, an amount of sort of upheaval during building works. There'll be a certain amount of noise it may be advisable if you're sort of a, a contractor or anyone like that to to advise your your client to speak to them anyway um just to try and improve neighbor neighborly relations um between you and um well between the client your client and, and their neighbor to, to avoid any animosity out of interest does um anyone know what that building is there um what's particularly interesting about that sort of basement flat there well, folks, if you want to comment, just feel free. Just to we'll leave that as a running comment. topic. It might be familiar to some, particularly if you're a music buff, you might know that who that is. But um, I'll perhaps come back to that a, a bit later on. Um, just uh, another check that we'd advise you to do as well would be previous works. So um, not really a consent that that's needed, but just if you are doing a basement conversion but perhaps there's a an existing basement so you're, you're redeveloping or something like that um or for for those that are doing inspections on on basements um perhaps further down the line as well 
Um, check for guarantees. Um, if there's been a history of previous works, it's worth checking, you know, particularly if there's a failure to see if the works are covered or even for um, sort of the conveyancing process or the, the sort of house sale process. If there's a guarantee, it will provide, um, particularly for the waterproofing works, it will provide sort of consumer reassurance or, or buyer reassurance, as it were. And also for, for building control, which we're, we're going to go into more detail very, very soon. Um, but with building regs, um, if you've got approval for building regs, that's obviously going to um, make uh, the resale of a property much, much easier, much more straightforward um, and potentially maximise the return on, on your investment as well. Um, it's going to give the the purchaser a bit more reassurance as well so a bit off off the topic but uh well worth noting i think um if you are doing any sort of inspections or um or buying a, or doing any works in existing basements another poll just to test if you're you're still awake so um and i haven't lost you yet because i am conscious like i say that um building regs can be quite a dry topic so before we get into the depth of them um does the conversion of an existing basement to a habitable space need to comply with building regulations? So yes, no, and depends. Well, folks, the poll is should be now in front <laughs> of everyone's screen. I can I can well, I can tell from your chuckle, James, that you're looking at the results as as they come in at the moment in time. I think we're looking at the results, it's fairly conclusive in terms of what people are thinking. It's certainly not like the last result. Um, guys, I'm going to leave it for about another five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. I'm just ending the poll. James, I'm assuming you can see it, but just in case you can, 87% said yes. Yeah, well, good. That, that's um, that's more reassuring. And the key in there is habitable space, I think. But um, good, let me um, get my slides back up. Did anyone know what was um, that other flat that I showed? Did anyone know what, um, what was interesting about that? Did we get any response on that one? Um, I've not actually seen any response as of yet, but folks, if you recognise the property, do feel free just to type it into the chat. And uh, well, I couldn't see any response. Well, let's be, let's not dwell on that one. It was mm. um, it was apparently Bob Marley's old flat, so that was um, the music connection there. Um, that's a bit of a left field one. So I, you know, I can't blame anyone for not getting that. Um, so building regs. What are building regs? Um, and what's the difference between building regs and planning permission? I, I'm actually fairly um, reassured by um, by the results of that last poll, which is brilliant. Um, planning permission is obviously consent to do something or um, permission to do it. The other one, building regs, is obviously the standards that it must be done to. So that's sort of the distinct difference between the two. Why do we have building regs? Um, you know, and I said this is basic stuff, but, you know, let's start with the basics. Um, the building regs are there to help ensure the safety of the building. So this is the um, the LABC definition. The building regs help ensure that the new builds, conversions, renovation, extensions, domestic or commercial are going to be safe, healthy and, and high performing. So that's what they're there for. But how do we comply with the building regs? So uh, the Ministry of Housing, Community and Local Government, um, publishes what we call approved documents. Um, the approved documents are arranging documents from A to R, so um, there's a, a whole suite of them, um, that give you um, guidance on how to comply with the building regs. So they are guidance documents. They, you don't have to necessarily follow the guidance in the approved documents, but you must be able to demonstrate that you have complied with the building regs in another way. Um, but that's where they are. And then we're gonna start looking at some of those sort of the more interesting sort of headline parts for, for each of those documents now. So when the building regs become applicable, um, we spoke about building conversions. I, I think I briefly saw someone ask about sort of cellar and basements. And it's, if you are saying is a, a cellar, a, a, you know, a, an area used for storage and a, and a basement, sort of a converted space, I guess. Um, but if you're making it into a residential, you know, a habitable space, um, then the building regs are going to be applicable. Um, exemptions may apply if you're building a plant room or something like that that's not visited by people. But if you're looking at something like we've got there, like a, a domestic setting, then yeah, absolutely building regs 
are going to be applicable. Um, so, yeah, and, and responsibility falls to those who carry out the works, uh, the designers, the installers, and, and principally the, the building owners as well. So now we're going to look at sort of the some of the headlines sort of of the, the building regs or each of those approved documents, as it were. Um, I've gone straight to B. Um, I know some of you will probably be pointing out, well, what about A? A is a very important one for anyone who's not familiar with approved document A. It looks at structure. Uh, the reason I kind of glossed over or am glossing over it on this one is I think it's obviously a lot more applicable for new builds where you've got the, the options of what you're going to do with the structure a lot more. But obviously it will be applicable if, if you're going to be making changes to the structure as well. So that's things and you may need to you know, consult a relevantly qualified engineer or whoever it may be. Um, but getting into, um, you know, approved document B, which is perhaps I think the latest one to have a, a big overhaul, um, and that looks at fire safety. Um, and for anyone that's wondering why it had a big overhaul, um, I think the answer is fairly obvious in that picture there. And I think the, the tragic events at Grenfell are a good reminder about why we need to be following building regs as well. Um, I know there was a, a range of factors that contributed to, to the disaster there, but we, but building regs was was clearly one of them. Um, so this is why you know another reason why we feel that this was a, an important webinar to to, to deliver to you. Um, like I said, we're, we're not going into minute detail, but we wanted to plant the seed that you know if you're looking at basement conversions, if you're um, if you are sort of doing or delivering sort of a basement conversions, then, you know, some of the things that you, you need to consider. Um, so approved document B very much covers um, fire safety. So there's sort of two main areas for approved document B for, for consideration for basements. The first is means of escape. So if you habitable rooms in a basement require a safe means of escape of leaving the building, it gives you two options. Um, an emergency escape window or external door pro uh, providing escape from the basement to ground floor level uh, or a protected stairway um, leading from the basement to a final exit. So, you know, somewhere that's enclosed from, from the fire that you can get out to, to the front door, as it were. Um, so if anyone's looking at that picture, you, you've obviously got sort of a, a hatch there and, and a great just another sort of word of caution. If you are using a light well as a, a means of escape, um, make sure you know it's covered so it's not a someone's going to fall into it and cause themselves harm. But equally, if you are using it as a means of escape, don't put a wheelie bin on it either, because that ain't going to fare so well as a means of escape if you're trying to get out there as well. So that in the corner you see it's a, a wheelie bin put on the grate there. That, so yeah, don't do that if it's a fire escape. The second area that sort of approved document B covers, which is quite applicable for basements, is spread of fire as well. Um, so if you've got a, a basement and you've got two stories above, the structure must provide 30 minutes of fire resistance. So you must be able to deliver a, a certain amount of fire resistance for the building. Um, that does increase to 60 minutes where there is four stories or more. Um, if the basement and the upper story is more than sort of well if there is height external height of more than 4.5 meters above the ex lowest external ground level then the basement must have fire separation as well so you compartment compartmental compartmentalization rolls off the tongue but um so you need to be able to use that area as a separate area um and you must sort of have it as isolated separated as well so considerations if, if you've got that sort of 4.5 meter height as well so moving on that's sort of the headline figures for for b um approved document c um approved document c is site preparation and resistance to contaminants and moisture um for most of you i know there's a, a lot of waterproofers here so uh, resistance to, to moisture is you know going to be right up your alley um and obviously we're looking at, and for those that sort of aren't sort of dealing with sort of water in basements on a, on a daily basis, but obviously you're below ground. Um, there is very, very much a risk of um, water table hydrostatic pressure coming to bear against that structure. So water is always a consideration. Um, and approved documents say um, 
is and looks at resistance to, to moisture and, and contaminants. With regards to basements, um, and it, it says um, where walls and floors are subject to water pressure, the design should be in accordance with BS8102. Now, for anyone that's not familiar with BS8102, it's uh, the cornerstone of the waterproofing industry. It's the code of practice for protection of low ground structures against water from the ground, and it's essentially the waterproofer's bible. It's a very, very good document. Um, we have covered it in, in other presentations, so I'm going to give sort of a very brief overview of some some of the headlines on this. But um, you you will be able to find more on, on our other presentations or webinars. So, so go search it out if you're not familiar with the document. It's very good. But um, some of the, the key headlines that, of what it does, um, and many of you will probably be pointing out that it is also currently undergoing a, a review as well. Um, from what I understand, uh, it's more of a refining than what it is sort of a full rewrite. So um, I understand is that design philosophy and, and things like that are, are looking to stay fundamentally the same. But um, the document itself, the code um, sets out a, a design philosophy based on a, a risk um, based approach to, to waterproofing design. It sets out three grades of, of sort of waterproofing or environment and how a means of achieving that. So three waterproofing strategies as to how that might be achieved as well. So I'm going to look in those in a, in a bit more detail. The document as well is applicable um, to full basements and partially submerged basements. So if you've got like a, a half basement as well or one retaining wall, this is still applicable. So this is a, a table that I'm sure many of you like, know like the back of your hand and, and I might understand it has been a matter of, of intense debate, should we say. But um, in 8102, table two, uh, it sets out three grades of, of dryness, as it were, internal environment. We've got grade one, um, which is some seepage and, and damp areas tolerable, depending on intended use. You've got um, typical examples would be a car park, plant room. Um, you've got... Grade two, um, plant rooms, workshops, um, no water penetration acceptable, damp areas tolerable, ventilation might be required. And then you've got grade three, which is ventilated residential and commercial areas, including offices, restaurants. So no water penetration acceptable, ventilation, dehumidification or air condition, conditioning necessary, appropriate to use. Um, the one thing I was keen to pick up on uh, on this table, and you might have guessed by the title we've got, um, Grade three there versus habitable. I've seen people fall into a trap, um, particularly sort of contractors or, or people providing sort of the waterproofing design for um, a basement conversion. When you're providing a grade three environment, you are providing a dryness, a level of dryness in that, that environment. You are not providing a habitable space. And um, we've seen, or I have seen sort of some confusion where um, a report might have been done and people would be getting confused that they think they're ending up with a habitable space because you are designing to a grade three environment which would be suitable for a grade uh, for a habitable space but you're not providing a grade three sp uh, a habitable space and i think there's a trap that sort of people have fallen into and you need to be careful to to make sure you're very very clear if you're um doing something for your for a client if you're you know, if you're a contractor, something like that, or whoever you may be, that providing a grade three environment does not provide a habitable space. It just means you're providing the grade three level of environment, which is suitable for habitable space. Um, so a, a, a very key dis, um, sort of difference between those two. So they're the grades that it's, it tells you to set out. And then it sets out sort of three means of, of achieving that. So there, there's three types of waterproofing. Um, type A, which is a barrier, um, which is uh, something for like um, cementitious renders, cementitious slurries, something like that. Um, just a couple, but there's obviously a lot more. Um, type B is where the structure provides the, um, the primary, form, well, the, the resistance to the passage of water. Um, so essentially, normally that means sort of waterproof concrete. Um, and then you've got type C, which is water management. This is normally sort of cavity drain type um, systems of, of waterproofing. So if you're not seeing that, it allows water to enter the structure, but then that water is now managed, but there is a dry environment internally. So that water is dealt with and, 
and shipped out. Um, again, I'm not going to cover this in, in too much detail because it's been covered in others. Um, but they're the three methods that it sort of details in 8102 and you can use any one or, or a mixture of those. With basement conversions, realistically, you're looking at either a type A or a type C, um, obviously trying to retrofit the, the structure to, to provide any sort of, uh, as the primary form of waterproofing is, is not particularly feasible. One of the other sort of key points of the design philosophy of, of 8102 is it, it sort of promotes the, uh, the idea of teamwork. And it says that um, it is essential to, to get sort of the relevant people involved at the early stages. So it, it promotes the idea of getting a geotechnical engineer and a waterproofing specialist involved at sort of the earliest point. So, you know, we're, this is where um, approved document C points you to. Um, and this is what it's telling you to do. So um, the building regs are telling you if you're doing a basement conversion, you should be getting your waterproofing specialist involved at the earliest stages as part of your design team to, to help you ensure you've, you've got a successful waterproofing project. The, um, the last point on, on sort of 8102 that I want to make is that it also tells us that we can't be perfect or we shouldn't expect things to be perfect um, and tells us to expect defects as well. Um, it tells us essentially there can be defects as a result of two things, which can be the, um, the materials being inappropriate to use or alternatively, um, poor workmanship, which let's be honest, is more realistic with the best wheel in the world. Um, no system is perfect. And this, this uh, code of practice tells us to, um, to anticipate that. Um, so moving on, um, a bit the last thing on, on approved document C, um, as I say, it says about um, ground gases. Uh, well, it mentions contaminants as well. So we've got approved document C is looking at moisture and contaminants. One of those contaminants is ground gases. So it says reasonable precautions shall be taken to avoid danger to health and safety caused by uh, contaminants. So, what are the contaminants? So for the purpose of this requirement, uh, contaminants means any substance which may be harmful to persons or buildings, including substances which are corrosive, explosive, flammable, radioactive or toxic. So that's very much described ground gases, doesn't it? So approved document C tells us that we should be looking, considering ground gases as well. It tells us that we should be doing some, some form of risk assessment for ground gases if we're looking to convert that structure into a habitable space. Um, unfortunately, um, in reality, um, we know this this doesn't really happen. Um, it tends to happen more on um, new builds um, because there's that planning commission um, that, that's required. So when that's done, there tends to be sort of more requirement for it. But when it's um, when it's just a, a basement conversion, Unfortunately, because there's no physical defect, you know, it's very hard to pick up. And that, that is sort of the, the nature of ground gas that it is very rarely picked up on. Um, but if we're, you know, the, if we're looking to plant sort of seeds and, and, and be thought provoking, we should be following um, building regs. And, and that says that we should be giving consideration uh, for if there's ground gas. Um, I'm going to skip over approved document D, uh, which looks at a toxic, toxic substances. So unless you're building a basement for, um, you know, a nuclear reactor or something like that, which I'm sure some of you probably do, but um, there's probably not much need to, to cover it in this presentation. Um, approved document E um, is very applicable though. Um, that is resistance to the passage of sound. Um, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail here, but if you've got sort of a, a conventional sort of timber structure, wooden floor, you know, joists and floorboards, there's not going to be much resistance to the passage of sound. If you're looking to convert that room below to a bedroom, it's going to be a bit noisy down there. It's all right, you're sticking your teenage son down there or whatever it may be. Um, but if it's your, going to be your own man cave or whatever it may be, whatever it's going to be, you know, you need to have some sort of passage to the resistance of sound. Um, retrospectively, that may mean sort of replacing of the, um, the floor coverings and, and how you detail the, the ceiling. It may involve um, ceiling gaps in floorboards. So um, again, you may need to, to consult the relevant people on this, but just, you know, be aware that that is a consideration you might need to make. 
that approved document f um so for anyone that knows me knows that this is sort of one of the ones that i am more passionate about but We mentioned earlier that um, we looked at those grades of waterproofing. We got sort of grade one, two, and three. Grade two and three both made reference to ventilation, and particularly grade three, where it says it must be appropriate to use. How do we ascertain what is appropriate to use? Um, and that's what we're going to look at in a bit more detail now. So um, I think F is very, very important. Um, the other thing you need to consider is basements by their very, very nature are subterranean structures. They have less air exchange than what you'd have in a building above book ground. So um, there is a huge amount of importance on providing ventilation, appropriate ventilation in a, in a below ground structure. So approved document F, uh, what are the key aims of approved document F? Well, approved document F is about controlling moisture and other pollutants. Um, in reality, um, moisture is the first one to become obvious when you get sort of condensation mold growth. Um, and it's probably the easiest to regulate as well, um, or to, to monitor, I should say. So in my opinion i think moisture is sort of the, the, the key and you know i'm sure there'll be a lot of dispute on that and, and people might disagree but i think personally moisture is obviously the easiest one to to use to to measure uh, regulate and then um, and use to, as a, a yardstick as it were so this is what approved document f is um and essentially it says that um the building should be free of um, mold and, and pollutants and condensation so that's what we're looking to achieve how do we achieve that? So there are several ventilation strategies that are set out in approved document F. Um, well, there, there, there's four that are principally set out. Um, I won't go into those in more detail now, but the, we've covered those in, in previous webinars as well. So another plug back to another webinar. Look at this, it's all threads, isn't it? But um, the one thing that is important to know is that, and the point I'm, I want to really try and emphasize here is when you are installing ventilation, um, particularly in a basement, because of the nature of what they are, you need to ensure you have got adequate ventilation because there is that reduced air exchange anyway. Um, so you should be doing it to the rates that you get in approved document F and you should be choosing a ventilation strategy that is appropriate for your basement. But you should also make sure that you are getting that um, commissioned as well and, and this is oft, so often overlooked when it comes to, to venter how can you assure that your ventilation system that you put in that space is doing what it's meant to uh well it should be being commissioned and for those that don't know that in the, the bottom right hand corner is an anemometer um a powered hood anemometer and that will allow you to check the flow rates of your extractor fans um so it will help you establish whether your your ventilation is doing what it will do so if you go in and you've done a building uh, a basement conversion you've got a condensation problem and you point to an extractor fan i've you know i'm sure we've all seen it a lot of times we've seen newly installed ventilation systems that make a lot of noise and, and sound like they're, they're doing a lot but in reality you know they've been poorly installed they're poorly ducted and, and don't do very much um so the key point I want to sort of try and make there is if you with your ventilation system, it must be commissioned. It must be tested, it must be commissioned, and, and there should be documentation to prove that it has been done properly as well. And you know, documentation should be provided to the owners as well to make sure that they know how to use it, how to maintain it, and to prove that it, it, it's doing what it's meant to do. Just a, another word to the wise. Um, some ventilation systems rely on purge ventilation as well. So you, you the, the need of a sort of supplementary air supply as well. Um, and that can be very, very difficult in basements as well, um, purely because of the nature. So um, just be aware of that. Moving on, um, approved document H, um, so which covers drainage and, and waste disposal. So just a couple of things to, to point out on, on this one. Um, so, if you've got a basement where you have put sanitary appliances in, so if you it's will at kitchens, um, if there is a high risk of flooding in that area, the sanitary drainage must be pumped. Um, so you have means, you know, you, you can't rely on gravity to, to get rid of your water. You've got to make sure that that system is pumped. If there's a low risk of flooding, um, 
then you need to make sure that there are sort of anti-flooding valves installed. So there should be means if you've got sanitary appliances in a basement, they should be suitably protected. So if you're doing an inspection, you, you might want to look for that. Um, but there are sort of waterproofing systems, particularly tight sea waterproofing systems that might be linked to, to drainage as well. So what um, what precautions must be used if, or, or what do the building regs say about sort of a, installing um, drainage systems or connecting to existing drainage systems, should I say. So um, essentially this says uh, clause 7C, um, it says you can join to a, a public sewer. Um, it says you must choose. So if it's a, a storm drain or a surface water drain, you should connect to a surface water drain. If it's a foul drain, you should be connecting to a foul drain. So make sure you choose which one you, you're pumping and, and where you're gonna just charge to. Um, it says that the manner of the connection uh, yeah. should be to, to such a point where it, it's not going to compromise the system. Uh, so still make sure that the public drain is, um, is not compromised by your works in any way. And the other thing is it says you must give notice as well. So before you take any of those actions, if you're, you're installing to a, to a public drain, you need to make sure that the um, sewage undertaker is, is given 21, 21 days notice. Andy, Andy, have you got your mic on? I'm getting a bit of feedback here. Uh, my apologies if it has been. I just noticed that I might have clicked it on by accident. Sorry, James. No, no worries. Um, so just a, a few more. I noticed we're, we're sort of running out of time a bit. So um, approved document L1B. So we've looked at sort of, this is different to the, the other building regs that we've looked at so far. And um, Everything else has been very much about preserving, or not preserving, but looking after the safety and, and the health of the occupants. Um, L1B is a bit more different because unlike looking at safety, this is looking at sort of uh, the welfare of the planet, I guess, for want of a better term. So this is about energy efficiency. Um, it looks a bit sort of, if your structure and, and looking at pervert, uh, providing relevant U values for, for each of your, your structural elements. Um, but it also um, gets you looking at um, any ventilation system, which obviously we've, we've just looked, spoken about. So your ventilation system, it must be uh, at a rate where it's, it's going to prevent energy loss as well. So it's a bit different. Um, there is a range of um, documents in for proof document L. So you've got L1A, which will look at existing buildings, L1B, which is the one that's applicable to existing documents as well. But any insulation, uh, particularly a lot of waterproofing systems will have an element of insulation in there. You need to make sure sort of it complies with um, L1B as well. Um, a do approved document P um, is electrical wiring. I'm not going to go into any great detail on this, but again, it, it's sort of something to consider. Um, when having any electrics installed, um, you know, it should be done by a competent person, um, someone who can self-certify. Um, and everything should be done with um, BS 7671, which is the, the wiring regs, obviously. You've got water and you've got the potential and electrics and, you know, the two don't mix very well. So you just be careful when you're doing your electrics. I'm glossing over it, making, you know, um, but you know, that's what approved document P is. Make sure you get your competent person because the two don't mix very well. So a bit of an overview, um, of a quick summary. In most cases, planning permission won't be required for basement conversions, um, but that will be dependent on the extent of the work. So if you're gonna need to put a, a new fire escape in um, and you're putting a light well in or anything like that, then you are gonna need to, to apply for planning permission. If you're digging down, um, again, you, you may need planning permission, but as I said before, if in doubt, always ask. It's better to, to know in advance than, than take the risk. So if in doubt, ask. Um, building regulations will be applicable if making into habitable space. Um, so the one thing I would say, make sure you're clear, particularly if you're a contractor providing, um, you know, a basement waterproof and wherever it may be, Make sure you're clear as to the, the extent of what service you're providing and how much you know you're doing to provide a habitable space. So if it's just providing a grade three environment, then make sure you're very, very clear on that as well. Um, 
I appreciate this has been a, a very whistle stop tour. It always was going to be um, purely because you know there, there's a huge range of these documents. And I say I, I'm not building control. I've given sort of my sort of headline figures uh, or headline points that I see it as a, a waterproofer, um, and very much from a, a basement conversion point of view. Um, and if you want to start looking at sort of the development of um, new build structures, if you want to start digging down and, and doing sort of what we consider retrofit basement, so you know a bit building a new space under an existing building. Um, Again, there's going to be a lot more sort of building regs that are going to be applicable, um, principally A. Um, but for further reading, um, there's a good document by TBIC, um, which is that one on the left there. Um, guidance document basement for dwellings, which covers all of these. It covers A in a lot more detail. I'd say this is predominantly focused on um, new builds. It's a great document. It's not a light read by any means. Um, but it is a, a you know a very well put together document if you are doing sort of um, anything with regards to um, building control on, on basements then that is well worth picking up um, another good resource uh, but probably more focused towards um, consumers I would say would be the planning portal um, that's a, a website I don't www.planningportal.co.uk or .com or .cub, something like that um, but it is a very good resource there is a, a section on there which is devoted to, to basement conversions as well um, it's a fairly easy fairly sort of understandable like I say very much um, aimed at um, sort of consumers um, domestic that sort of thing um, so well worth it you know it might be worth pointing out to to you know whoever you might be dealing with um and at the very very beginning i sort of mentioned that we'd, we'd written a technical technical note um a couple well probably about 18 months ago now just shy of 18 months ago about um building regulations and basement conversions it is sort of headline figures as well um and they're well worth a read i should also give um, another plug for um tbs here they, they released a, a pretty good guidance document the other uh, last week on um basements and ground gases as well um well worth a look um very comprehensive document as well 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 put together well so again worth having a look you, i think there's a cost for both of those documents as well i can't remember off the top of my head what they are but they are good documents um one last plug um which is um if you want to know more i know i've sort of pointed you back to various webinars along the way um because this has been very much sort of broad brushstroke stuff but if you want to know sort of more detail particularly around 8102 um i know andy mentioned our online surveyors course earlier on today um so surveyors instructional waterproofing is now available online alternatively you can still do it as a three-day course here in Huntington if you want to do that as well um a ventilation masterclass which is the one you can see in the photo there um again i very much glossed over ventilation but if you want to know more about ventilation the building rigs involved in that the ventilation masterclass is a great course for that um i don't know anyone that that sort of not come away with that and sort of really had their eyes wide or opened as to how to get to, to compliant ventilation and then there's various other courses as well um we'll have our the return of our structural waterproofing conference next year as well for, for those so, so watch this space on that as well but um other than that um thank you very much thank you for listening um hope you enjoyed it well james here many thanks for taking us through that that journey i have to say um when it come when it comes to the when it came to the first poll um quite an interesting mixed bag there when it came to about the planning permissions on basement I would have never have guessed that that it was unlikely to actually be needed that you actually needed permission but in fairness and in fairness and I do have to say this to the audience I am not a techie individual um, so it would be well beyond my knowledge but if I was to guess and it was on a 50-50 question on who wants to be a millionaire I would have said yes silence <laughs> so, sorry andy i say that again no i was just saying just a very interesting result on the first poll about the planning permission on a basement i would if i was to guess and this would 
if I was to guess, I would have said yes. I I would have never have thought that you wouldn't need permission to to convert that basement within that existing. Oh, well, yeah, only if you've got yeah, be careful. You know, like I say, yeah. even doubt always ask. You know, sound guidance in it. That's mm. um, better to do it than um, you know. And as as a contractor as well, you know. I think you or, or anybody actually no, that this isn't just relevant to, to, to contractors but for anybody um, you want to make sure that you are providing um, your best clients for the best service you can the best information to, to your client and you know if you're unsure point them in the right direction let them know you know go to, to the right people and find out what the correct answer is you know don't don't get it wrong well, um, we're at that time um, for any questions that were posed over the course of the webinar. Um, I will say we don't have a lot of questions, James. You might be quite relieved, but I suppose for the audience out there, it's a good opportunity for yourself to fire over a question and with it likely, to, likely for me to be able to ask it and for James to answer it. So I'm just going to hit off with the first question uh, first question comes from Jonathan Stewart. Uh, should valuation surveyors be asking as standard for confirmation a basement has complied to building regulations? Ooh. I think it would be prudent to ask. Yes. Like, you, you, um, you're doing your mm. your client engagement anyway, I, I believe is sort of deemed as best practice. But you, yeah, why wouldn't you be asking the question? But not just for the basement, you know, even for any form of building which you know particularly ventilation as well um you know back on my hobby horse there but yeah so mm -hmm. yeah absolutely okay um next question comes from uh mike kidder uh, no he's actually got two points to his question so first point um are we classing sellers as basements and if so are the regulations the same or are there any difference right so Right. Hopefully I'm, I'm understanding your question right here, Mike. So are you assuming a cellar is an unconverted space and, and then a, a basement is something that is made into a, a residential space? So I think that's sometimes where the, the distinction is made between the two. Um, if a cellar is a cellar in, in that regard, if it's just sort of a, an empty void storage space, then no, it doesn't. What I, I, I was keen to, to try and sort of point out during that is we were very much looking at conversion into a habitable space. And I think I made that sort of use of that term quite a bit. So no, it's just a, the cellar and still a cellar, then it's, you know, then no. Well, when, just when, when you mentioned, that, that probably ties on to his second point quite nicely, which is about habitable spaces, which you just mentioned there. Because the second point was, um, if a cellar was converted to a utility room, would it need building regulations? Now, I suppose this might be depending on what the definition of that utility room is. Would that be classed as a habitable room or not? Uh, yeah, it depends on, for my mind, yeah. I mean, if they're just using it to put a tumble dryer down there or, or whatever, and, you know, it depends on the, the extent they want to go to and how they're utilising it. Um, you know, they've just got some crude wiring down there and, you know, it doesn't comply with building rigs and that's all they want to use it for. But if, the, you know, if it's a proper utility room, you know, with uh, particularly with you know, like a sanctuary where like we, we spoke about in there, then yeah, absolutely should. OK, OK. Well, next question from Robin Miller. Do building regulations require more than one type of waterproofing, a waterproofing system to be approved? Um, no, I don't believe the building regs do. Like I say, the, the building regs will um, put you back to 8102. Mm -hmm. um, 8102 is about risk, um, and you've got to look at your risk. Um, and if you feel the risk mm -hmm. is high, then you need to look at adopting two forms of waterproofing. Okay. Okay. Well, you, you may want to consider that. That's, you know, it's not. The, most of the warranty providers may stipulate that's what they want, but that's there based on their um, assessment of the risk. So, the, I, the building regs, I don't believe, stipulate that. Um, again, I, you know, I, I'm not a boffin on, you know, every minute detail of the building regs, but it puts mm. you to 8102, and that's my interpretation of 8102. Okay. Well, next question comes from Adrian. Adrian, name so good, he says it twice. I'm assuming that's Adrian Dawson that's out there. But Adrian, 
Adrian's asking, from your experience, uh, I am principally putting your experience here because I think this could be a, 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 um, a question. Is this only the setting me up for a fool? Is it yeah, no, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, just, just basically painting the, painting the cat. Well, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not very good with my words today, but from your experience, when it comes to designing a basement conversion, do you think there's enough knowledge out there towards appropriate insurance and PI cover? Now, what he goes on to say is, are people aware they could be liable for corporate manslaughter should someone die, i.e. as a result of being trapped in the basement? I would say, you know, if you, if you again, it goes back to the point I was making earlier that you should, as a client, you should be, you know, providing your, as you, you know, you should be giving your client with as much relevant information as you can or, or the best information you can and you know with regards to ensuring they've got appropriate insurances and things like that then you know you should make them aware of that okay, okay. well moving on because the questions are actually now coming in thick and fast oh, um good. i've got a question from denise kumar this is more of a kind of confirmation i think this might have been a a, a slip from yourself but he's asking um uh well he's mentioned i noted james mentioned a grade four waterproofing could you please elaborate what grade four is? <laughs> do you know i'm not entirely sure i did um and if i did it was more of a slip of a tongue um there was once a grade four um so before the last incarnate incarnation of 8102 in 2009 the, the 1990 version there was a grade four which was for like archives and something like that if, if I mentioned it, it was more of a slip of the tongue then, and I think um, I was obviously counting up the grades and didn't mean to, to mention that. I just obviously stopped to count. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so um, in eight one oh two, there's three grades of waterproofing: one, two, and three. If I mentioned fourth, then yeah, <laughs> I don't know why I did that. But um, yeah, so there, there was a fourth, but um, it now I've pulled into three. Okay. Well, next question comes from Kevin um, Gotry. Um, is past 2035 now i believe past 2035 is to do with energy efficiency in older buildings but feel free to correct me wrong here again i'm not a techie but, is that past 20... of, um, but yeah carry on andy sorry yeah is past 2035 relevant to below ground structures that's a good question um my assumption would be it, it would be but then that's about the installation of retrofit measures so um you know i'm not I don't see why it wouldn't. It's, I, I can't remember the full content of eight. Uh, mm. Has 2035, you know, verbatim. But um, I don't know why it wouldn't be. Um, again, sorry. But yeah, um, is there any particular point that he's asking? You know, is you know, you're looking at the, the installation of retrofit insulation in that document so yeah, kind of a bit different more than a basement conversion but mm. um yeah I, I you know i i don't know word for word in has 2035 where it does color basements but i don't see why it wouldn't but there we are well kevin if you want to kind of elaborate if there is a specific point then feel free just to knock it into the comments we'll keep well, asking on an email like i say I, you know yeah. it's mm. not one i know what you know word for word but um if there's a conversation to be had there I'm more than happy to have it so send perhaps private message me and, and more than happy to look, to, to look into it no worries well um just kind of moving on um keith devore morning keith um keith's asking what is your view on light well drainage back to internal pump this just goes to show my lack of taking knowledge i have no idea what light well drainage is maybe you can kind of elaborate on that james well, if you can imagine you've got a light well, it's a big, it's a, a space open to the elements and it's going to have water going down into it. Um, if you're using that as the same, you know, drainage that's draining your, your outside, your inside um, space as well, then, you know, you need to give it additional consideration. I'm going to sit on the fence on this one, but um, yeah, it's speak to your tea manufacturer, but you know, it, it does require additional consideration. It's not. Um, well, folks, yeah. we don't, but, but the one thing I will say, we don't be, uh, we don't pretend to be absolutely experts of knowledge everywhere. And honestly, if you have an opinion 
on this. We welcome those opinions. So please do get onto the chat and um, join the conversation. Join the join join in with the answers and tell us what you think. So as I, as I mentioned at the beginning, just go to the left or right of your screen and just go into the comments box and fill it in. Um, and well, I, he's, just, he's asked for, for my opinion. I, I would always be cautious. <laughs> it's not you know. Um, True, true. Well, um, I've got two more questions just really to kind of hit you with unless anyone else is, uh, wants to fire across any questions. Next question comes from Greg uh, Baldry. Um, how much training should a ground worker um, have to be classed as a competent installer of, a waterproof, of waterproofing systems, especially when it comes to new build plots? I don't know. That's a, that's a good question. Um, I mean, they've got to be able to demonstrate a, a level of competence, you know. Um, it's just a, a strange way of phrasing it. Um, I'm always dubious um, and, you know, I'm perhaps going to stick my head on the block a little bit we see quite a bit where inexperienced ground workers think there is money to be made by doing waterproofing um you know it's, it's a specialized industry but but they're there they're already in the hole in you know that they've dug in the ground and, and think you know we we can add a bit more money or you know get a bit more profit from it but they don't truly understand what they're doing uh, i mean i could probably plug our, our courses here um you know, the, the manufacturers will probably give you some degree of training, but if but it's not just down to, to the people that are installing it. It's down to the um, the design as well. So it's what's the minimum level? I, I, it's hard to answer really, but you know they, they they should know what they're doing. They you you want them to to have done it before because that's where it can all go wrong. You know, even with the best design, if the people that are putting it in the ground don't know what they're doing, then it's going to fail. Okay. Well, folks, um, uh, the, James, I was wrong. I thought I had two more questions to hit you with. It was <laughs> just the one, so you can <laughs> wipe the sweat off the brow now. I don't know. I'm just looking at some of these, um, the, the different, the, the, the seller basement argument, you know, is it the same? Is it different? You know, it's quite an interesting one. I've seen different perspectives of it, but, um, but yeah, anyway, Karen. No worries. Well, here, folks, just um, for those that are looking for a little bit more information, you heard James alluding to some resources for yourself. Um, that, to, from our perspective, there's certainly a wealth of information that you can gain from our Structural Waterproofing Document Library. The link is on the screen there from Codes of Practice to Best Practice Documents and Guidance Notes. Um, uh, it's a fairly extensive library, I would suggest definitely encourage to check it out. There are other supporting documents out there, BS 8102, Approved Document F, and you heard James mention it earlier on, very recently um, uh, the Basement Information Centre released a new guide um, towards ground gases and waterproofing. Um, they also have a supporting webinar that goes along with it, it's an hour long. I would encourage that, if you, I would encourage all to go along, take a wee look at it. There is a cost for the guide, for the, the TBIC guide, that's £10. Just to remember that it's not a prohibitive cost, but yes, check it out. And also, if you are looking for additional information, feel free also to go to the professional waterproofing section of the PCE website. Um, I just want to say that for those that are looking for um, a little bit nudge of extra help, there are training courses you can go on to start off with a, a new online severe training for structural waterproofing. We've just released new dates for this in October and November. It is effectively our classroom training converted into an online basis with eight live sessions, 25 recorded window, uh, videos, um, interactive sessions, multiple trainers and a wealth of information and uh, an extensive library. Uh, uh, on top of that as well, there is technician training for structural waterproofing coming up, as well as our training course on waterproofing legal aspects. If you do want to find out any more information, the link is at the bottom, or you can simply give our training team a call on 01482 400 000. 
Um, last but not least, I just want to say a big thank you to yourself, James, for the, the presentation this morning. I want to also say a big thank you to everyone that tuned in uh, this morning and for listening. And last but not least, um, just to say uh, uh, a, a good morning to everyone and also I hope you have a fabby rest of the day. Thanks for tuning in everyone and we will see you in the next webinar. Mm -hmm.